All right, so this lecture about quality of life, unfortunately not outside the world of terminal experiences. So we're gonna just cover some like small, not, not mistakes, but small tips and tricks that we see students struggle with during the, uh, the course. So yeah, we'll just jump into it. So yeah, it's about navigating the, the terminal, like how you use the arrow keys and small shortcuts and how to find files so you don't have to sit and uh, like manually look for files and also how to transfer files back and forth from Raka. So the first one, which some might have done already, is use the up and down arrow to step through commands that you have written. So if I just bring up this terminal and increase it a bit in size. So can you see this? So if if I want to go to this folder that I went to up here, if I want to type that again, I don't have to start typing everything once more. Instead, if I just press the up arrow on my keyboard, I see the most previous command that I did. If I press upwards once more, see the next, and I can just keep going and, you know, here are all my historic commands that I have run the last couple of months, probably. And if you go too far, you can press the down arrow, and then it will go back or forward in history until you reach now. So you don't have to retype a command. Just press the up arrow. And then here from here, you can use the arrow keys to you know change something if it was a typo. So you don't have to retype too many things. And if you know that you typed a command, but you don't remember if it was a week ago or yesterday, or it's just too long to use the up arrow, you can use control R to search for previous commands. Uh, so if I want to load the same modules as I did yesterday, instead of, you know, when does module load arrive? Instead, I press control R, and I enter this reverse search mode, and then I just start typing anywhere in the command that I'm looking for. It could be load or module load, or if I know the name of the module, if it was R, I might type a capital R. But let's just start with module. Ah, look, there it is. That's my module command I was looking for. If it isn't one, if I'm looking for one even further back, if I press Control R once more, I will jump to the next hit. Oh, maybe not that one. And then you just press Control R to go back and back and back. And eventually you will find it. And when it stops taking Control R, you reach the end and it didn't find any hit. Oh, come back. No. I want to make this a bit smaller so you can actually see what's happening. Yeah. So if you have a very long command, and especially if you have a Mac computer, because those, for some reason, have a lower tick speed when you hold the left arrow. So like if I have this long command and I want to go to the beginning, the Macs are a tiny bit slower. So it's super annoying to help someone with a Mac when you have to go back. Or, but there are other ways you can jump around the command line than uh, using just the left and right key. So if you press Control A or Control E, you will go to the beginning or the end of the line. So let's say that we have a very long line like this. If you want to go to the beginning, I press Control A. And if you want to go to the end, I press Control E. So it's good. If you want to go to somewhere around the end, just Control E, and then you can use the left and right key or Control A to go to the beginning. You can also jump words one at a time. This kind of depends on also your terminal program. I noticed that my terminal program, it will catch when I hold the Alt key, because it will think I'm trying to do something with the menu up there. So instead of Alt B, I can go, I can go backwards. But if I do Alt F, it will open the file menu for me. But if you have a different terminal program, Alt F will jump forward a word. 
And most of the time you can hold control and use the arrow keys, but sometimes like now, you only get weird characters printed out. I haven't really figured out why this is. Sometimes when you open a new terminal, if you hold control and press the arrow keys, it would jump words. Sometimes it doesn't. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Cursor position. One thing we see many times is that people, they go back, they correct a spelling mistake here. And then when they want to press enter to do the CD command, they first do this. They go to the end of the line and then press enter. You don't have to do that. The cursor can be anywhere. The computer doesn't know where the cursor is. It just executes the whole line. Yeah, and just a function built into Bash that remembers the previous directory you were standing in. It only remembers one step back, so you can't jump back two steps. So let's say that we're standing in our home directory, and we CD to a project directory. Then we're now standing in the project directory. If then type CD and a single dash and press enter, it would jump to where you were before. So in this case, it was the home directory you were in before. So boom, now we're back there. And if we do this command once more, the previous one that you were in was the project directory. So now you're back there. So it remembers the last directory. So it's nice if you just want to pop up somewhere, check something, and then jump back. So now we're at the point where we want to copy things back and forth from Upmax. So we've seen how to copy files within Opmux, then you use the cp command. And uh, if we want to copy things from outside Opmux, you have to use a different program that knows about different computers, because cp knows only about the current computer. So now we can use two different programs. One is called rsync, and one is called scp. It's a very similar syntax to cp, that you have the file you want to copy first, and then you have where you want to put it. And in this case, if the file you want to copy is on a remote system, you have to tell it, OK, so where should I log in? So in this case, you just type username at the computer name colon, and then the path to the file. So if this was Opmax, it would look something like this. So rsync, your username at Opmax, at rackham.opmax.u.se, colon, and then the path at Opmax. It won't work to tab complete when you're typing this command because this is on a different computer. So this will copy the file in your home directory on Opmax called t.txt, and it will place it on your local computer where you're standing, one single dot here where I am. And it will use the same name as the file already has because you don't have to specify new new name. Ugh. Usually when you run rsync, you get no feedback. It just starts downloading the file, and it will tell you when it's finished. If it's a very large file, it could take a while. So if you give it these two options, the dash A option stands for archive mode. That means don't change the modification date of this file. Because if you download a file, then it will reset the modification date, because the downloaded file was modified just now, because you just downloaded it. But if you want to preserve that information to see that, OK, so this is the file that I edited last year, then it's nice to have this dash A option. And then you do the dash capital P, stands for print progress. So if you just try these commands out, so I'll open a new terminal for that. Oops, wrong way. Make that a bit smaller. And now it's good to have two terminals, one on my local computer. I have one here at Opmax. So here I can check names of files. So I don't have to remember the path. I can just check. Okay, so in this folder I have, this is a pretty small file. This will go very quickly to download. It's only half a kilobyte. This one is a bit larger. Let's take that one. So this is the folder I'm standing in. So I can copy. Then I type here, rsync ap. My username is Darlow at colon after the host name, the path to the file, 
And let's see, what was the name of this one, the big one? It's proteinsec.fa. Then I'll say, I want to place it here where I'm standing. So now I started downloading and we can see a small progress bar, maybe not a bar, but at least a number saying roughly how long time is left and stuff like that. And in this case, in the first example, we copied a file from Upmax to our computer. You can just as easily copy a file from your computer to Upmax. It's just that you add this Upmax information on the destination or in the, the file you want to copy to. Yeah, I think that's just the example I just ran, but with a different file. And if you want to use SCP, one way that example is not here anymore, it works pretty much the same way. So we can try it out. So instead of rsync, oh, control A to go to the beginning of the line, SCP. And here you get the progress without specifying that you want progress, but it works exactly the same way. So and find is the command that you search for files based on file name. We can filter on a bunch of different stuff, but mostly it's file names that we're using to distinguish files. It's a pretty simple syntax. You type find, you say where you want to start looking, and it will start looking from that point and in all subfolders from that point. It won't go outside that directory like above. It will just go downwards. And then you can specify a filter. So in this case, we specify a name filter. So dash name, and then we say the name we're looking for. So for instance, we could do find in the folder I'm standing and everything below, the name star.txt. So if we run this command here, so find in the folder I'm standing, I want to base it on name star.txt. And it found one file in the file tree folder. We can have a look. I've used the tree command in lab. This one kind of prints out how the file structure looks. So this file tree is it's pretty big. So it would take a while just to go through and looking for this file on your own. But while using find, you saw it was quite quick. And if you have a program running like this, then it's probably going to finish soon. Let's go back to the slides in the meantime. So sometimes it's not the name of the file that you're looking for, but you're looking for content inside the file. Maybe you know that you programmed a script and you remember the name of a variable and you want to find that file again. You can use a different program called grep. I think it stands for GNU regular expression. And here you just type grep and then the text you want to find, the one you're looking for, and then you say which file you want to look in. So if it's a big file, maybe you want to find that section of a file. And if you have multiple words, you have to quote them. Otherwise, it, it will think that these spaces are separators between the arguments. So just use quotes around the text. If it's just one single word, you can still have quotes. It won't hurt. And then you can also specify here like a wildcard. So all text files you want to search. So for instance, if we go to this folder, SV courses, and just intro, Linux, quality of life, we have this big file here, proteinsec.fa. It's this big file that we downloaded before. So I could grip. So do we have a name from the audience? A short name, no longer than five characters. No? I search for my daughter's name. Her name is Emma. Does this occur in this file? It's a randomly generated file with all uh, valid peptide uh, symbols. Oh, 
There's a lot of stuff in there. The longer the name, the less likely it is it will occur. So I'm guessing Katarina, you're probably not going to be in the file. Sorry, no, too long name. Yeah, so this just goes through the text file. It's like 250 megabytes, 250 million letters, and just finds all matches of whatever string you type here. Bunch of those as well. And here we specified which file we want to search in. If we want to search in every file, we can telegraph we want to do a recursive search. That means go into all subfolders and their subfolders and their subfolders and so on and search for yeah, this text found. So we can go to this file tree folder here and say, I want to look at everything inside the file folder and in all the, the subfolders. And I want to look for the word found. So recursively means just continue digging downwards and find all the files. And the word is found. And in the file tree, all file types. I don't know if you need a star at the end or not. Let's try it out. Let's do something. Oh, there we go. So here it found in the file tree, in this folder, that subfolder, that subfolder, it was a file with this name. And in that one, it found this text where the word found was located. Then it will print out the whole line, the word that you found is on. You can also tell the grep a bunch of different options. Like if you go to the manual page for grep, you know, it, it has a lot of options you can give it. Like how many lines above the match should you print out? How many lines below the match should you print out? So who would have guessed that a program that looks for small pieces of text has these many options? Huh? So then we have another command or keyboard combination called Control C. It kills whatever your terminal is currently running, or it will ask politely if the program can stop. So let's try to start this program, the friendly counter. It's a small uh, Python script. Whoop. It just keeps going. There is no end. So you can see how many times it printed this line. It's pretty fast, right? But if we want to get out, I mean, nothing happens. But if we press Control C, it stops. You can have a look at this small script. It just contains this. While true, it will never stop. And then just brrr, keep going. Yeah, so you might encounter this like if a program just gets stuck somehow, or if it's waiting for the hard drive and opmax, or if you gave it the wrong input data, or maybe it's running just fine, but you remember it's the wrong sample. So you just want to abort it. Then you press Control C and it will stop. We used to have these mouse pads that we gave out, but they stopped making them. But it contained this opmax sheet sheets which contains like small explanations of uh, small common commands like rm file removes a file and then like opmax specific part here at the end they still have the uh, the pdf up so you can download and print and put in your cubicle to have a, something nice to look at during the day so yeah multiple terminals is really good as you seen just during this example, I've used two of them, one on my local laptop and one on Opmax. And yeah, just try to have two open. Usually this is how it looks most of the time when I'm working. I have two terminals open side by side. Both of them are usually at Rackham. And then in one terminal, I might be editing a script. And the other one, I can walk around. Oh, how was it? Which project folder was it? OK. Then sneak 2022 and so on. And just walk around and look at files in this terminal. Then I can jump back to this one and continue typing whatever I was typing. So just jump back and forth. So you don't have to close down this one and then go and check. And then you have to start it again. And yeah. Hmm. Hello. Yeah, you, I usually describe it as having multiple tabs in a browser window. No one has only one page open in a browser. You have many, right? It's not like you go back to a page and then you go to the other one. It's the same thing with terminals. So just have many open. 
unlike browser windows that don't take up that much RAM. So you can have like thousands probably. So those are some of the tips and tricks we wanted to show.